Stop focusing on your products, focus on your customer's job. So here's a financial services example. A client came to us and said, we wanna improve, we wanna innovate our savings and checking accounts. We said, fantastic, we'd love to help you. We're not gonna study those, we're gonna study the underlying job that those products help customers with. So what is that job that people are trying to get done with checking accounts and savings accounts and a whole host of other products? Well, through our discussions with our clients, we focused on this. We define the market as consumers managing monthly cash flow. By focusing on this job, we were able, able to help them innovate the, their checking accounts, their savings accounts, debit cards, credit cards, short-term loans. How could we do this? Because all of those products are in service of this job. Financial firms, like many other, are incredibly siloed. Shouldn't a financial service provider be expert in this job, in understanding this job at its most granular level? Is anyone in your organization focused on this job? Is there a group of people who say, hey, I'm the product manager, I'm the job manager of manage monthly cash flow? Think of the organizational change that might happen if you were to do this. Don't you think someone should be looking after this job? You'll see why it's so important as I move on through this presentation. So this is a pretty simple theory, right? Focus on your customer's job and bring clarity to the front end of the near, your innovation process. Open up the aperture. Look at what the bigger job actually is. It's not your product, but it's this bigger job. But people have made this simple model overly complicated. Job theory is a simplifying process. It's not a complicating process. It's a simplifying process. So let's make it simple. I've been in this business 20 years. Tony started Stragen over 30 years ago. But over the past five years, we've seen a massive increase in companies adopting job theory. We're excited about that. And we know that's the right way to go. Like we said, it's an economic principle. It's this reorientation that gives you all of these benefits. However, when we start to talk to them, something happens. It's clear that they've got a misunderstanding about it. Or at worst, they're, they're using it or gaming it to go back to the way they used to think in a product-centric way. Here's an example of what I mean. One of our large financial institutions came to me once and said, hey, we think we help our customers with hundreds of jobs. I just kind of smiled, raised my eyebrow. I said, I don't think so. I, I think it's something more like six or eight. I just made that number up, but I knew it was something radically different and I had to, I had to communicate that to them. Well, they thought I was crazy and the call quickly ended. They came back about six months later and they go, we agree, we think it's nine jobs. Fantastic, we agree. It's a simplifying process, it's a simplifying model. You see, everything is not a job. If it were, I'd agree with you that the financial services industry or your industry would be incredibly complex, but it's just not that true. It's just not true. So. I put this thing, I put this number out there, six or eight, and they said nine. And I said, well, what are those? What are those core jobs that a financial institution should be helping their customers with? Now, I'm putting it in context of all of these conversations I've been having with our customers over time. Every conversation I had, they said, we're trying to help our customers achieve financial wellness. I go, hmm, that's very interesting. So if I do these, these things right, I should be able to achieve financial wellness. When I asked my clients, what is, you know, how do you get there? What is financial wellness? Their definitions were not very good. So I said, well, let me, let me think about this. What things must a person do to achieve financial wellness? What I did was I reviewed many of our past projects. I had great conversations with lots of our customers and I read articles on you know, helping people achieve financial wellness or something, you know, achieve goals. The architecture I'm about to share with you is a result of that thinking. Uh, it's not perfect. It's a working model, but I think you're going to see how it takes a, what could be a very complex view of your market, if you think everything is a job, to something that is much, much simpler. So financial wellness, what is it? Well, it's a destination, isn't it? 
it's a state of financial security that one can achieve if they're successful in managing their financial life. Well, how do you manage your financial life? What are the things you need to do? Well, I need to develop financial goals and plans. I need to assess current, my, I need to know where I am today. I have to manage the inflows and outflows of my income. I need to sequester some and put it away to save and invest to grow wealth. I may extend spending capability via debt to do certain things in my life that I can't do immediately. I uh, may need to protect financial my financial condition. I may need to, uh, as I accumulate assets, put a wall around them to protect them a little bit. I need to maybe change my financial behaviors as I go through life and I have these life events that really change my plans. Then I have to verify that I'm on this path to wellness. We don't, we don't do this once, we're doing this continuously. So what you see here is not hundreds of jobs, just a handful. Now, there may be 50 to 100 outcomes for each of these jobs that describe the perfect execution of each of these jobs, but they're not hundreds of jobs that a financial institution is helping their customers with. There's some core ones, and then there are a bunch of outcomes under each of them. This model is really useful for a variety of things. First of all, it helps us look at the market in totality. Like what are the solutions that people are using to get each of these things done? These lists, this is just a short list on, it's very inexhaustive, but you could certainly add to these. What's really helpful about looking at it from this perspective is now when new competitors, be they FinTech or a non-traditional uh, player who wants to get into the space, be it Amazon or Apple or someone else, you can look at what they're doing and say, where are they actually playing? What are they actually doing? What are these jobs are they actually addressing? Now, they have no more right to success than you do. They have to follow these same rules. There's jobs and outcomes. These fintechs aren't doing new jobs. They're doing the same job. They're just doing it with different technology and different platforms. So now we have a way to analyze what others in the market are doing as well. The only competitive advantage these non-traditional or startups might have is they're not burdened with current products and platforms. However, if you reorient towards the job, you're going to start to discard that concern about those past products and services and really focus on that job. My fintech experience was we were technology driven and failed miserably, but we should be job driven to understand deeply how we can create value over time. Now, I'm going to take this model and go a step deeper. I'm going to take one of these jobs, the job of managed cash flow, and show you how you build out this model for one of those jobs. Again, I'm coming back to this hierarchy because I want to stress this because this is where the mistakes are made. I'm looking at one core functional job, and that is the job of managed cash flow. Then I have many outcomes that describe the perfect execution of that job. So let's see what this looks like in practice. We went out and interviewed consumers, Stratagen did, and we captured 84 outcome statements across these nine job steps. How did we do this? We just talked to them about the job of managing cash flow. They know it very well. Not any one person, but collectively over eight or 10 or 12 interviews, we captured all of these outcome statements. Look at, there are 84 outcomes that describe the perfect execution of that job. We also captured 16 emotional jobs. Emotional jobs are just emotional states that people are trying to achieve or avoid as they do the core functional job. We're not going to talk about the emotional side today. We're just going to talk about the functional side. So let's go down a little bit deeper and look at outcomes for each or for some of these steps because i wanted i wanted to show you how this simplifying architecture pays dividends over a very very long period of time so the job of managing cash flow the first step is receive money here's one of 12 outcomes for this step minimize the time it takes to verify that an amount received is what was expected note on each need you will not see a solution Nothing about checking accounts or savings accounts or credit or debit cards, just how the customer measures value for getting the job done. This frees the team from their solutions to focus on the best possible solution to help satisfy the customer needs. 
they're freed. They're free to think differently. How about this step, plan spending? Minimize the time it takes to determine how much is to be spent on essential expenses in a given time period. Do you think this was a need 30 years ago, 20 years ago? How about today? How about 10 years in the future? Yes, this need is the same need that they had 30 years ago and they're gonna have 10 years, 15 years into the future. That's because outcomes based upon jobs are stable over an incredibly long period of time. Capture these needs once, use them, innovate off of them for many, many years. You only have to do this once. How about this one? Set aside money for savings and investments. Minimize the time it takes to determine how much can be saved given current spending. Now, as you read each of these statements, think about the solutions people use today to set, help them achieve this or satisfy this. Do they use your products or competitors' products? Do they cobble something together to make this happen? They, this is a need. It needs to be satisfied. Companies satisfy it in a variety of ways. Fintechs may have a different, different model for satisfying it, but it's still the same job with the same set of outcomes. They play by the same rules. They just may be using a new technology or a new platform to help you get that done. But if you know the needs and you know which ones are unsatisfied, you know where to go create value, just like they do. A couple more of these. In deciding whether to spend money, that step, minimize the likelihood of spending beyond plan in a category. So are there new companies that are addressing these needs today through new technologies or new integrated platforms? How about a credit card with personally set limits on expense categories that would alert you when you're about to overspend? Now, I'm sure there's someone in this, in this meeting today that works for a bank that is already doing this. That's good. They should be. It's a need. It may be at odds with the business model of transactions, but it's actually helping the customer achieve that financial wellness. We're putting the customer first. Here's one, use credit to make a purchase. Minimize the time it takes to determine the total cost of using debt to make a purchase. Now for one, some segments of the market, this is incredibly important. They don't wanna be spending too much. They may not be paying off their credit card bill every month. And so they wanna reduce the amount of interest that they, that they pay on their credit card. Enter Apple, a non-traditional financial service provider and is taking a much more holistic, transparent view on their credit card. They're showing you how much interest you're gonna pay and giving you ways to lower that interest by paying it off more quickly. Now, if Apple is successful, other card companies will have to respond, but Apple will benefit by being the first mover here. I mean, this need exists. It's how you deliver against it is what differentiates you in the market. Personally, I think there are huge opportunities to innovate in the credit card space. I think you're going to see a lot more of this happening because I think there is a movement towards debt pay down and, and being more responsible with debt. But just think of all the possibilities when you free yourself from your existing products. I know it's easier said than done, right? But starting from the job and set of outcomes does give you that ability to imagine what the future will look like. We had a medical device company once come to us and say, we want to look at where we're going to be disrupted. We want to look at the needs that might uh, cause for disruption in our marketplace. So we, found, we went out, we studied the job, we got all the outcomes, we showed them where the opportunities were, we helped them create a disruptive solution. They never launched it. They just wanted it to be in place in case someone did it. That was very forward thinking on their part. But they could do that because they had these stable, long-term needs that described the perfect execution of that job. And if their solution wasn't doing it along certain dimensions, they knew which ones it wasn't. This is the last example I'll go with today. But I wanted to show you the statement and examples for, for a reason, Just to show you that this is happening in the market naturally. So on the make a payment step, Minimize the likelihood of suffering a bad consequence due to problems with making a payment. No one wants bad consequences, right? So enter PNC with their low cash mode. Say goodbye to surprise overdraft fees. Good for PNC. This is a solution that helps people say, wait, 
you're getting low, you have to be careful that you're not going to have any bad consequence of late payment fee based upon your balance. Now, I guarantee you other banks are doing this. I'm just showing you that the market over time will eventually uncover and address those needs. But wouldn't it be better for the organization to know what all those needs are up front? Then you're just constantly working at improving each of those needs. And you're not just doing this quick, you know, new feature here, new feature there. You know where to go create value. But then you might say, Rob, we have 84 needs. We need focus. Where should we focus? Well, this is the easy part. Now that we've captured the needs, we're going to go quantify them. That's all. We're going to go ask, how important is that need to you today? And how well satisfied is it with the solutions that you use? See, while the need is stable over long periods of time, the, the priorities of those needs will change as new solutions enter the market. So you've got the stable architecture to grow for years and years and years. All you have to do is requantify these every three to five years. And what you do then when you're quantifying is finding those gems, those ones that are very important, but not well satisfied. See, this is what we're doing now. We're providing a very precise model to show you where the market is underserved. Go back to the definition. We're trying to devise solutions that address unmet customer needs. Well, we have to know what they are. We have to know them in totality and we have to rate them. Now we've measured them. We know where to go create value. By doing this, we've de-risked our innovation process. The front end should be guaranteed success. Everything that we put into product development is going to be something that the market wants or a segment of the market wants. It's just our implementation is our only risk factor there. And that's downstream. The front end, we can almost eradicate the, the risk of doing something that the market is not going to like. We don't want you to fail fast. We want you to succeed, excuse me, succeed fast. So we're not iterating all this time. We're going to look at the outcomes and know which ones we want to go invest in. But wait, not all customers are alike. So we can't stop there. We're not going to build to the average of the market because customers don't agree on which outcomes are unmet. They struggle in different ways executing the job to be done. So we're not going to segment on demographic or psychographic or attitudinal. We're going to segment on the needs because we're innovating. We're segmenting for the purposes of innovation. So while the attitudinal and the behavioral and the psychographic stuff might be interesting, it's not what we need to segment for the purposes of differentiating in the marketplace. We'll still capture some of that information, but it's not the determinant of where we innovate. So we don't want to innovate to the average because there's no one solution fits all the needs. People have different preferences and how they want to get the job satisfied. So let me use an example from my vacation last week. And John, bear with me. I'm going to do a little backpacking uh, example. In this picture, you're going to see three tents. The one on the left is a copper spur two-man tent. That's my tent. I chose it because I like more room inside. That's all. I like to roll around you know, and have my gear in there, what have you. It's a little heavier because it's a two-man tent. The one to the right is a, is a copper spur single-man tent. Nice small footprint, lighter than mine. My colleague, my friend, chose to use that one because it weighs less. The third one, the blue one up in the right corner, is a tent that has no internal frame like the, copper, the two copper spurs. You set it up using trekking poles. It is ultra, ultra light. Now, there's positives and negatives to each of these tents, but we all selected different tents based upon our preferences. One tent doesn't satisfy the whole market, nor does one checking account or one, one credit card, or there are, that's why we have segmentation. So let's go look at what our market might look like. And here is a real example from one of our financial services clients. They have been in this space for 100 years. The space is helping people save for retirement. Now, you think after 100 years, the market would be perfectly satisfied, right? That's not the case. Look at this. 25% of the market is incredibly underserved. 
48% of the market is appropriately served with some underservedness in that dark gray area. And then 27% is overserved. Now, this is not just their customers. This is the entire market. So a representation of the total market. Now, I can't tell you what it's going to take to satisfy those 25%, but I can tell you it's not the platforms and the solutions that people have today because they'd avail themselves of it and they're not. So to serve this group, you're going to need a different platform. And there's fintech companies out there now that are trying to do this. But you only know this by taking a deep dive into the outcomes and then segmenting along those outcomes. Hopefully you're seeing how this simplified model of both the job you're not the, the 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 smaller amount of jobs that you really actually serve your customer with and having this precise understanding of the outcomes that you're going to be measured by is helping you understand how you can continuously innovate within a market we do all of this in service of this which is building a pipeline of opportunities to develop over years and years so if we identified 30 opportunities of those 84 that are important and poorly satisfied then we have some short-term opportunities that we might avail ourselves of, like better position our existing products. That's free money. That's just turning the marketing spigot, spigot on. It's optimizing marketing around the unmet needs. Or maybe it's improving our existing products, just tweaking some quickly to, to improve that satisfaction. Maybe more long-term, medium-term, we've got to fill gaps uh, with new products because we've taken a bigger perspective of our market. It's cash flow. It's not just checking or savings or credit or debit. Then we might see things that we don't have any of the even capabilities for. And that might talk might require long-term investment, long-term thinking, M&A perhaps. The benefits of thinking this way are the following. I'm going to finish up here in just two more slides. First thing we I'd like to say is it, it enables you to discover new opportunities in current markets. Now, why is this so important? Because you're not looking at your market from the job, you're looking at it from your product. I can't tell you how many of our clients come to me and say, we're in a commoditized business. Our market is becoming commoditized. Now your product is, the market is not. So it gives you a much bigger view of where there are opportunities in the market. We, we often find tons of opportunities in markets they say are commoditized. Second, align and simplify your organization around the core jobs of your customers. As I asked earlier, wouldn't it be beneficial if an organization studied this job of managing cash flow and someone owned it within the organization? Because then they'd be feeding all their different product lines the opportunities that they should be going and embedding in their solutions. Third, it brings clarity around new technologies to embrace to help you better serve customers. Don't do what I do work on a solution, I mean, work on a technology in search of a problem. Do the other way. Figure out where all the problems are and then just look for the best technology to help you solve that problem. Again, jobs to be done should be a simplifying process, not a complicating process. You don't serve as many jobs as you think you do. And at some high level, you know what those are. You can document what those are. You can capture all of the needs. And now you've got an architecture for all of the jobs that you help your customer serve. So when we want to help our customers manage their financial life to achieve financial wellness, they're going to go through some series of steps to help them get that done. We at Stragen have already done three of these projects on our own. And if Anyone on this call is interested in learning how you might avail yourselves of the work that we've done in these areas to do a quicker, uh, a quicker project than one of our bespoke consulting projects, I'd be happy to talk with you about that. I've got my contact information uh, coming up and feel free to link in with me or send me an email to ask me about those.